Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 3. Go ahead and turn to that. We're going to look at verse 11 from last week. We didn't really look at it last week, and then we're going to jump into chapter 4 and just kind of do an overview of chapter 4, but let's pray first. Father, we come before you as we open up this passage of Song of Solomon, chapter 4, tonight. Lord, I ask that your cherishing heart would woo us. You would awaken us to courage and to a holy resolution to go to the high places with God, to ascend to the very mountaintops in the Lord. Holy Spirit, come and romance the heart of your weak bride. Give us strength and courage in your embrace to go forth into high places with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, again, uh, most of you know that uh, this is on the uh, uh, this class is live on the web every Tuesday night. But from now on, at the halfway mark, on any of you that have friends that you want to bring, I've always made it my uh, tradition on the fifth week and the classes that I teach. After that, anybody that you want to bring to the class, you can. So uh, feel free to do that. They can hear it on the web, or they can come here on Tuesday nights without. Registering. That's uh, something that I kind of do, a little thing that causes a little chaos to the system, but I've done that for years and I seem to get away with it. So you can do that from, uh, from this time on and hopefully we'll have enough notes. We'll make a few extra notes. Okay, Song of Solomon chapter 3. Well, actually chapter 2 to get the context of the last couple of weeks. In chapter 2, she was enjoying the Lord in a place of devotion in her private life in the Lord and we established that line upon line, and she was enjoying the Lord in the private place, and the Lord in chapter 2 verse 3 was, was releasing His great sweetness and pleasure, and she was experiencing what we call the superior pleasures of the gospel, God's great strategy to set us free from sin. The inferior pleasures of sin is not merely to have us grit our teeth and say no to enticing yet in t- inferior pleasures, but rather He introduces into our experience the superior pleasures of the gospel, which are far more powerful and it's a far more substantial way to walk in obedience because we're walking in, bedi- in obedience in the beginnings of love sickness, chapter 2, verse 5. We, we love to feel loved and we love to feel love back and she's beginning to experience the sweetness of verse 3 and 4 of the love sickness, verse 5. That we know in chapter 2, verse 10, The Lord comes, I mean, in verse 8 9, He he comes skipping and leaping on mountains, presenting Himself as the Lord of the nations, the one who dwells on the high places, number one. The mountains speak of the high places in the Lord, the places no one has access to except by the Holy Spirit escort. The high places, I like to refer to it as the Holy Spirit opening that vast treasure chest of the beauties of Christ Jesus and the mountain, and the high places of the Lord, and He beckons us to come out of the comfort zone with the Holy Spirit in partnership to experience the high things of Jesus. And secondly, the high places, as we looked at, speak of uh, the obstacles that the Lord is is is, uh, beckoning us out of the comfort zone to face the obstacles that hinder our deeper life in God. He skips and leaps on the mountaintops, and He beckons her in verse 10 of chapter 2, come with me. And she answers uh, in verse 17, I, I, don't, I don't want to turn and go leap on the mountains without me. She turns him down, and we understand that it's because of her fear and her immaturity, not because of rebellion. And there's a vast difference between immaturity and rebellion. She is not rebellious, she's immature in verse 17. She goes, I can't do it, I don't have, I don't have the understanding and the courage to, to leave the comfort zone, to ascend to the high places both the high places with the Lord as well as confronting those places of fear in her own life. Chapter 3, verse 1. She seeks the Lord and the Lord hides His face. It's the beginning of divine discipline. We looked at that last week. And the Lord's divine discipline is not His rejection. God's correction is not rejection, but rather He corrects us because of His affection, because of His longing for us. And we looked at that last week. Chapter 3, verse 2, she says, I now will arise and I will go. So after the season of discipline, it worked. The Lord wooed her out of the place of fear. 
He hid his presence from her because she said, I would rather have your presence than live without you in the comfort zone. It's safer with Jesus on the water than with the apostles in the boat if Jesus isn't in the boat. That's what she comes to understand. So finally in chapter 3, verse 2, she says, I will go, which really she's simply obeying the charge of chapter 2, verse 10. We looked at last week the revelation of Jesus as a safe Savior, chapter 3, verse 6 to 11. We didn't get to verse 11, and verse 11 is one of the most significant verses of that, of that uh, session. Though we're on chapter 4 in, in session 11 now, I want to go back and look just for a moment, and then I will uh, abbreviate a little bit, uh, little bit more uh, on the notes. I'll just reference a few things on the notes, and we'll go uh, more rapidly instead of me covering all the notes with you. But now, after she has experienced the exhilaration of a new revelation of Jesus as a safe Savior, and we define what it means that He's a safe Savior, it doesn't mean she won't have difficulties, but it means she's in a place where her heart will be tenderized in love, and her heart will be established in the love of God, and nothing can stop that in the gospel. Her first response now is chapter 3, verse 11. She wants to exhort the daughters of Jerusalem from verse 10. She renames them the daughters of Zion, their prophetic name in verse 11, because it's, it's the very nature of what's happening. She begins to see them according to the Spirit and the way that the Lord has seen her, which is really the real theme of chapter 4. It's how the Lord sees this young bride in the Spirit. She gives an exhortation, really it's a two-fold exhortation in verse 11, but I'll read the verse to you first from the New King James. She says, go forth, O daughters of Zion, go forth and see the king, see the king with the crown with which his mother crowned him. We understand that King Solomon is the picture of King Jesus. See the king with the crown with which his mother has crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. One of the most significant verses in the entire song. We didn't have time. We ran out of time last week. It's a twofold exhortation. He tells, she exhorts the daughters to go forth and to see. Now each one of them strengthens the other. The more we see, the more we go forth. And when we go forth to ascend the high places, we see more. The rich become richer. It's the principle of the kingdom. To them, to the one that has, more will be given besides. We looked at the principle last week that you cannot ever maintain your place in the Spirit by simply staying, in, uh, uh, I mean, with, without growing. The only way you can maintain what you have in the Lord is by taking new ground. When we cease to take new ground in the Lord, we actually lose the ground that we've gained over in in that recent season. There is no static place in the Spirit. There is no place where I enter into an experience of divine revelation where I say, this is that. If I don't move on into more revelation, the freshness of the revelation I have today will be lost tomorrow. The only way that we can keep the ground we have is by taking new ground. You absolutely will lose ground if you don't take ground because it's a kingdom of love. It's a, it's a divine romance. It's a lovesick God wooing people into love sickness. It's about the heart inflamed. It's not about, it's not about uh, uh, having a, a doctrinal test to see if you can dot your I's and cross your T's. It's about being inflamed in love. And he wants people that are lovers more than workers. He wants workers but he wants workers who flow out of the reality of being lovers, and love knows no static place. If you're not increasing, you're decreasing, and Jesus says it. To the one that has, more will be given. To the one that does not have, even what he doesn't have will be taken away from him. It's a very important principle. So go forth and see. She's challenging now the daughters with the same exhortation the Lord gave her in chapter 2. She says, I know that the mountains are scary, I know that they're frightening. The high places of the Lord is the unknown, the place of deeper revelation of God. It sounds romantic, but the journey can be perilous and even costly. She's beckoning them in verse 11, go forth in the same way the Lord beckoned her in chapter 2, verse 10. Come with me, rise up and come. And she said no. But in chapter 3, verse 2, she finally arose and she found a safe Savior. She was exhilarated by what she discovered in the Lord. And now she's telling others, you can't afford not to go. Last week we talked a moment about the price of discipleship. But far more costly is the price of non-discipleship. What it costs us not to go forward in terms of our heart being locked. 
Our hearts shrinking and dying while we're, on, while we're literally living. As born-again believers, we live with a locked heart, a dead heart. That's far more costly. Non-discipleship costs us far more than discipleship costs. She's beckoning them, arise, go to the mountains, begin to seek the deep things, the high places with God. But she focuses in on this very, very significant revelation of Jesus. Jesus, the king, with the crown for which his mother crowned him. It's a very significant revelation. Now we know from Revelation 19, verse 12, and that's in the notes from last week. John the Apostle looked at Jesus on the wedding day on Revelation 19, the great marriage supper of the land. Lamb, and one thing that John noticed, Jesus had many crowns on the wedding day. He possesses many crowns, not figuratively, but literally. He's, he's crowned king of the earth. He's king of eternity. He's king of the angels. He's king over every realm of God the Father's vast empire. He has many crowns. He is coronated as the chief monarch, as the sovereign over every realm of God the Father's vast empire. And he's crowned king as a man, not just as God. It's a human king. But the Spirit of God is focusing in, focusing in on one particular crown here. It's the wedding crown. There's something about the wedding crown. There's a particular crown that a monarch would wear on his wedding day that was unique from a crown that he would have when he conquered another nation. A wedding crown was a very distinct and unique crown. And it's this thing that the, that the uh, young bride is beckoning the maidens, the younger ones, to see. Because it's this that awakened her heart with courage to ascend to the high places. It's what we called in, I think, week two or three, the bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God. It's the crown which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding. The, 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 the idea of the mother is is a, uh, a concept maybe seven or eight times in the song here. And we looked at it from comparing Paul the Apostle and a few other passages. The mother speaks of redemptive history. It's that for which God's purposes flow out of, and God himself depicts the redeemed his, through history as the mother that begets his purposes on the earth. And when all those verses, we, I, I, again, I have the verses in the, in the uh, notes from last week. But the crown for which the mother crowns Jesus, see, God the Father crowns Jesus, but in one regard, the redeemed crown Jesus. Now, we don't crown him in all of his other crowns, but the crown that we put upon him is our response as voluntary lovers of God. God has so orchestrated his kingdom, he has so uh, administrates his kingdom that it operates, redemption operates by the principle of voluntary love. There's one crown that God the Father cannot give the Son of God apart from our participation. It's the crown, it's the wedding crown, it's the crown of voluntary lovers. And it's the redeemed through history on the last day who stand before the Lord and they profess before all the angelic and the, 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 the demonic host, we love you because we want to, not because we have to. And on that day, we crown him. The redeemed through history crowns the, the Son of God as the lover of our soul. It's a voluntary thing. Solomon, call, or the Holy Spirit in this, is calling it the crown which his mother crowned him on his wedding day. It's the wedding crown. It's the crown of the love of the redeemed, the voluntary love of the redeemed bride. And it's this reality of the Messiah, it's this dimension of our Messiah that awakens deep places in our spirit that no other truth awakens. And it declares that he is glad. It's the day of the gladness of the Son of God's heart. It's the day of the gladness of his heart. He was sorrowful as he entered into Gethsemane. This is the day of the gladness of his heart, Revelation 19, the wedding day, when the redeemed through history are presented before him and they say yes to him and the crown is figuratively put upon his head, which is the, the uh, uh, accumulated response of the redeemed throughout church history. This is the crown for which she's exhorted, she's exhorting the younger ones to look at. The dignity of being the ones that crown him that make his heart glad. The, 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 the glory of being the ones chosen as his bride. It's the bridegroom king that stands before the young bride. And she preaches to the daughters of Zion and she says, This is the one that awakened me. It's this revelation that gave me courage to ascend. It's the wedding crown. Beloved, this is the greatest gift that God the Father gives us 
the power in the Holy Spirit to crown Jesus with love, the very love that God the Father put into our heart. There is nothing that you will offer more powerful on the last day than when you cast your crowns before him and comes before him in voluntary love. That God the Father, the uncreated God, the uncreated God, first person of the Trinity, would empower my broken, weak, sinful heart to give something to the uncreated God, Christ Jesus, second person of the Trinity, and there would be something that would make his heart glad, and it would be something that would crown him, defines my life with a dignity beyond all the angelic host. That we have the power to crown him in this way. The Spirit of God describes this as the day of the gladness of the heart of God. How does Jesus feel about this vast plan, this wedding plan? How does he feel about it? He's glad about it. This is not a, a shotgun wedding. This is not a political wedding. Solomon engaged in many political weddings. He had many wives that were nothing more than political alliances with surrounding nations. He says, Jesus says, I am so glad about what is happening right now. My heart is ravished, he will say later on in chapter 4, verse 9. Why is he glad he's getting married? What is he glad about getting married? What's the thing that makes him glad? Because the ceremony is so fantastic. No, he's glad about you. You are the reason he's glad on his wedding day. You take a, a bridegroom on his wedding day, and he's been waiting and waiting, a long engagement. He's not so concerned about the flowers or even the music. It's the bride coming down the aisle. And the Lord declares his gladness over the redeemed from, from all of redeemed history as they come up. The meaning of creation will no longer be hidden. The day of the gladness of his heart, the reason for which he has done everything through history is now apparent to all. For in his gladness, Revelation 19 verse 7 says, the bride is made glad. For we rejoice and are glad on the day of his gladness. Psalm 45 verse 8 calls it the, is the day of his gladness as well. Isaiah 62 5, he is glad as a bridegroom over a bride. And those are all in the notes from last week. We are made glad in his gladness. Now he tells the, the daughters of Jerusalem, which he, she prophetically designates them as the daughters of Zion here. She says, you go forth and do what I did. Get out of the comfort zone. Begin the process. Go forth. Begin the process of ascending to the high places. Begin as soon as possible. Yes, the parable in Luke chapter 14, but I have a field to sell and I have a farm to attend and I have this and that. The Spirit of God says, go forth now and begin to ascend to the high place. There's always a reason to wait for another year to press into the high places in the Lord. Now is the day of salvation. Begin now. Go forth now, daughters of Jerusalem. She says, I wasted that time because I was afraid for nothing. It cost me more to wait than it did to begin the ascent to the high places with the Lord. I love the word O oh, in verse 11. Go forth, O oh, daughters, this earnest this exclamation point. She's saying, oh, I want you to see what I've seen. You will be fascinated. You will be stunned. Your heart will be romanced by the Son of God. Begin now to go on the great journey. Chapter 4. Now we're beginning our notes, session 11. You have to have 311 to understand 4.1. That's why I had to do this. Besides, it's a great verse. We have the verses here. Behold, you are fair. The word fair is the word beautiful. My, behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You are beautiful. You have dove's eyes. Verse 2, your teeth. Verse 3, your lips. Verse 4, your neck. Verse 5, your breasts. Verse 6, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and I will ascend or I will go my way to the hill of frankincense. The Lord speaks back to her. You are altogether beautiful, it says in the New American Standard. You are all beautiful. You are all fair. There is no spot in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. Come with me. Look from the top of the mountains, etc. From the lion's dens and from the mountains of the leopards. There is so much that is going on in here. The Lord challenged her in 2.10 to arise. To arise. 3-1, she dis I mean, in 2-17, she disobeyed. 3-1, she's disciplined. 3-2, she says yes. The Lord has not spoken to her since that. 
time. The Lord has not spoken directly to her in the storyline of the song until chapter 4, verse 1, where he announces, but behold, you are beautiful to me. Jesus is prophetically affirming eight budding virtues in her life. Each one of these of these uh, characteristics of the young bride's life speaks of a budding virtue that the Lord Jesus is calling forth in her immature state. <clears throat> I just give a little summary of it. <clears throat> We're going to skip a, a number of things just for time's sake, and I'm giving you the notes so you can read them and study them again. I'm mean, going to say that every week, uh, so... I'm going to give you far more than we can cover because I want you to study this outside of the class. Let's, let's look at this issue. I'm calling it the cherishing heart of Jesus. Paul the Apostle said that, that he might present her a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, that she should be holy and that she should be blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives and nourish and cherish them just as Jesus does the church. And here's my point here, is that Jesus nourishes and cherishes the church. Paul taught that the church would be glorious and the church would be radiant. The NIV uses the word radiant. The church will be filled with glory and will be radiant with the life of God I believe before the Lord returns, His church will be filled with glory and will be radiant in love. The joy of love is what makes the church radiant. Feeling love and from Him and feeling love back to Him absolutely changes, I mean, uh, it it, it, uh, deeply impacts her and changes her emotional chemistry. The power to feel cherished and the power to feel passionate in response is what makes the church glorious and radiant. The Holy Spirit will reveal the cherishing ministry of Jesus' heart in the generation of which Jesus is revealed as a heavenly bridegroom. And as I've said week by week, I believe that the Scripture teaches us that it's in the generation the Lord returns that the Spirit and the bride will say, come. There's many verses that describe the response of the church to the Messiah as a bridegroom in the generation that He returns. It's in that generation, particularly, the Holy Spirit is granted the, the, uh, in the wisdom of God the release to reveal the cherishing heart of Jesus, I believe, like no other time in history. And the church will be glorious and radiant as Jesus nourishes and cherishes His church. Paul reveals how Jesus plans to bring His church to radiant glory. His divided, immoral, bitter, angry church will be filled with glory and radiance. And he will do it by Jesus nourishing and cherishing. And it's the word cherishing. He is going to stun our hearts with his love for us. And he's going to fill his church with radiant glory. There's much revelation in the Song of Solomon about how he cherishes his bride. The cherishing dimension of the heart of God is the prominent theme of the Song of Solomon. That's the unique theme of this entire song. How does Jesus cherish us? By releasing his affections to us. By letting us feel a little bit of what he feels when he looks at us. When we feel even a little bit of what he feels, we feel cherished. It changes our emotional chemistry. The way he cherishes us, he esteems us so important, far more important than the angels. He beckons us into a bridal partnership that he invites no part of created order. He invites us and only us into a position as co-heirs, as into bridal partnership to, in his embrace, fulfill the mandate that the Father gave him to disciple the nations and then to rule the vast empire for billions and billions and billions and billions of years. He beckons us into that and in that he cherishes us. He says, you and only you are the one that I have chosen to share this great noble task of ruling my Father's kingdom. He cherishes us in a way that's very important in our lives now by affirming the budding virtues in our life. When we stumble in weakness, he defines our budding virtues. The enemy has worn down the church with accusation and condemnation. The Lord cherishes us by looking at our spirit and calling forth the reality of what's in our spirit that others don't see about our lives. 
We so easily believe what the enemy says, that we're hopeless hypocrites when we stumble, when we discover the weakness of our flesh. We give up. We're just hopeless hypocrites. We confuse immaturity for rebellion, and we just give up, and the Holy Spirit comes along and says, no, that willing spirit, what we've taught on week by week, he calls forth the willing spirit and says that willing spirit will bud into mature virtues in the days to come, and that's what he's doing here in chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. He defines her by the longings that he himself has put into her for Jesus. It's not as if Jesus, as if the Holy Spirit of the Father or just the Godhead doesn't see our sin. The truth is he doesn't see only our sin. He does see our sin, but he doesn't see only or mostly the sin of the redeemed. We lay in our bed at night and we go, oh God, I would love to be free from this thing I'm struggling with. And the Lord defines us by the longing of our spirit to be free, whereas the religious community will only define you by what you attain outwardly. Oh, I love the example of Gideon, and there's a number of examples. I'll just summarize it. Gideon is, uh, is uh, the way the Midianite army is, is attacking Israel, and it's a national calamity in, in, the, in the largest order. Gideon is hiding in fear. The angel of God appears to him. He's shaking like a leaf, hiding in isolation and fear, trembling. And the angel says, oh, mighty man of valor. The Holy Spirit saw in Gideon the truth of God in him, what Gideon could not see. And I developed that. That The Lord looks at Peter, calls him the rock. Well, he's going to deny the Lord. A little bit later in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13, he's going to cause tremendous confusion in the early church because of his fear of man and his hypocrisy. But Jesus says, you're the unmovable one. You're the stable one. You're the one that others will count on and find strength from your stability. Paul the apostle might have said to the Lord, yeah, but he denied you. And he even caused tremendous division in the early church by his fear of man problem. You'll find in Galatians 2, verse 11 to 13. And the Lord says, yes, I know. But in his spirit, there's a man of courage and he is a rock. And I'll go with my definition over him. I love the Lord's editing process. The Lord looks at Abraham after he compromises a number of times. In Romans 4, verse 20, he says, and Abraham never wavered in his faith. You go back and read Genesis, and you say, well, Lord, look, there's a number of times he wavered. Acts chapter 13, verse 22, and verse 32, David fulfilled all the will of God. You look at the life of David, and you say, wait a second, there's horrendous scandals and compromises, and the Lord says through my editing process, he fulfilled all the will of God in my generation. I said, well, in that case, I'm going to rise up and enjoy the embrace of God. The Lord sees the end from the beginning. He sees the seeds of character. He speaks to us with such clarity. Listen, he sees the end so clearly. He sees eternity. God has total insight and he has total authority. He not only sees the budding virtues, but he has the authority to bring them to maturity and to completion. He looks at you and he calls you lovers of God. The enemy looks at you and calls you a rebellious, hopeless hypocrite, and there's plenty of leaders in the body of Christ to confirm what the devil has to say about you. God looks at you and calls you the rock. He looks at you and he calls you lovers of God. He calls you the one that God loves, as John the Apostle uh, entered into that identity, that spiritual identity, as we looked at in the earlier sessions. Now that we have just a little bit of the background, she's in the journey of the, in the storyline of the song. She's only said yes. In verse 2, she says, okay, I'll go to the city. In chapter 3, verse 2, he told her to go to the mountain. She only went to the city. But she says, yes, I'm going all the way. She sees this new revelation of Jesus. She's preaching to everyone around her. You know what? It's really wise to get up and go. But you'll never have the power to ascend the high places until you've seen a king with gladness who's glad about loving you who sees that you will love him and your love is sure. You, He will be crowned by the mature love the power of God will put in your heart for him. Whether in time or eternity, you will be a mature lover of God. The crown is sure that the body of Christ will crown Jesus on the last day as the voluntary lovers of God. She begins to speak out of the sovereignty of God and say, he's a king, he's a glad king. He's a glad king about being married. He's a glad king about marrying 
You! And the, and the daughters are going, wow, arise. Every sacrifice before you will be nothing when you see the big picture of the glad king on his wedding day, glad in the love that he has put in your heart for him. It takes God to love God. Now the Lord breaks the silence after the discipline. He has not spoken to her since chapter 2, verse 14. He hid his face from her. He has not spoken to her directly till now. And he gives the most stunning words. We would have thought it would have been a warning. It would have been a rebuke. It would have been something other than this. The king with a crown, with a big smile on his face. He walks up to her and he says, Behold, you are absolutely beautiful to me. And this young bride is looking around thinking, well, I've only said yes, I haven't yet gone, because she doesn't fully walk this thing out till chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, but she has said yes, and the Lord counts the yes. He knows it will mature in time. Imagine the drama of the hour. The great king, imagine the greatest man, I mean the the great uh, fairy tales that are famous through history. The king walks into the town and the young maiden who everybody has written off, the king captures the king's heart and the king calls her forth out of the great multitudes and shocks her and stuns her with the surprising cry, Behold! And God trumpets out of the heavens. Behold! There is a beauty you possess you do not understand. I am a glad king and I am glad about marrying you and you will crown me with love one day. I can see it. My father's already guaranteed it. It's about my father's promise to me. You will crown me with love and I love when I, I love what I see when I look at you. And we say, yeah, but we're still growing. We're still maturing. He says, there's virtues in you that you do not understand. They will mature into mature expressions of love. <clears throat> Leah, stand up for a second. I asked your mom if I could do this. Leah, you're 14. I'm not going to embarrass you too much. You're 14, right? Imagine the great king comes in, and there's the massive crowd of people, the throngs, the angels, and the, the devils. Everyone's gathering, and the king walks up. Behold, Leah, you're beautiful. Your beauty is stunning, and all of redemptive history is watching it. And the Lord Jesus cries, Behold, your beauty has captured me. This is what you will experience one day from the greatest one that has ever walked the earth, the Son of God himself. It's kind of shocking, isn't it? This is nothing. But at least you got a little, tri- a little uh, a pop quiz beforehand. Oh, beloved, this is true. When he says, behold, it's a trumpet blast by the Holy Spirit. It will shake us to the very core of our being. When he looks, as he singles us out. This behold is not a whisper. This thing resounds through all of, all of created order. You are what I esteem as possessing the very beauty of God. You have captured my heart. This is the romance of the gospel. This will give us power to ascend any hill, to challenge any obstacle whatsoever. It's the romance of the gospel. It's called the power of divine lovesickness. It's the first commandment restored to first place in the life of God's people. There's four reasons why we're beautiful to God. We looked at this in some earlier sessions. The gift of righteousness through the finished work of the cross makes us beautiful in the garments of righteousness. We already looked at that. We're beautiful because of the willing spirit put into us at the new birth. We looked at that already. This is just a little review. We're beautiful because of the nature of God's heart. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. To anyone else who had a different personality, that had a different emotional makeup, we would not appear beautiful. But to our God, because of the nature of how he feels and sees and esteems, He sees beauty in a place in our lives where nobody else can. It's it's a reflection of the nature of God. And we're beautiful because of the, the certainty and the finality of our destiny as the adorned, enthroned, embraced, co-heir bride of Christ Jesus. God sees the very end. He knows where we're going and he sees the destiny that we have in the gospel and he sees the beauty already uh, adorning us in the destiny that no man can take from us. Beloved, our beauty is astounding. Now we've, now one day, well I won't do it in the series, but sometime I will. It's a fascinating study 
to follow the progression of the theme of beauty through the Song of Solomon, there is a very specific and biblical and theological progression. She sees a little bit of the Lord's beauty, and then a little bit of her beauty, then more of the Lord's beauty, then more of her beauty, and now the Lord doubles it here. Chapter 4, verse 1, like he did in 1, 5. He said, behold, behold, he's shocking her. He's waking her up. He's stunning her, because on the last day, he will say this before all creation, when we stand as those that crown him with our love on the last day, one of the crowns that make his heart so glad. Oh, beloved, behold, you are beautiful. This, this reality will wash us and cleanse us. It will cherish us. The eight virtues. By the way, by the way these are eight areas that reveal God's beauty in us. They demonstrate our beauty before the Lord as well. They're reflections of the Lord's beauty imparted to us, but they're things that make us beautiful as we stand before God, these eight virtues. These are eight things that make the heart of Christ Jesus glad, the verse before. When he sees us grow in these, but here's another thing, these are eight things that will make you glad. I love to talk about the excellence of purity, the joy of abandonment and total obedience. There's an exhilaration in our spirit when we know there is no fear, there's no pull on the earth strong enough to keep us from our pursuit, you are liberated, you are alive like no other person on the earth except for those that are walking in that way. Beloved, 99%. Oh, that's powerful, but there's something in the final thing that's turned over where you say money, reputation, honor, convenience, Physical comfort, I care not, I am yours. Your spirit is alive on the inside when, 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 when we come to that place. There is nothing that I will say no to. Most of us say, Lord, we will say yes to almost everything. And it's that very mindset that keeps us experiencing so little, only the superficial parts of the superior pleasures of the romance of the gospel. The first characteristic he honors is her eyes. Oh, and again, throughout the song, the, the, the subject of the eyes are fantastic. Look up the eyes and, and ask the Holy Spirit to help you to follow the progression of the Holy Spirit wooing her and focusing upon her eyes. Eyes speak of seeing. They, they, they refer to faith and revelation. Paul spoke of the eyes of our spiritual understanding. He, he emphasized that seeing was the most significant thing. Seeing, the ability to perceive was the key to everything else. That's why when our Bibles are dusty, and because we haven't opened them, our hearts shrivel up and they become locked and stagnant. When we see, the rivers flow on the inside. And the Lord has invited the body of Christ to the high places. He's beckoned us to open the Word and to come before Him in times of seeking Him, Prayer, and if you want to increase it, if you want the thing to be, if you want that catalytic uh, dimension, throw a little fasting in. Fasting, what fasting does, it accelerates your capacity to receive the free grace of God. Fasting doesn't move God, it accelerates your ability to receive. Fasting is a catalytic dimension of the grace of God. What took you one unit of, I mean, five units of time, with prayer and fasting, you enter into it in one or two units of time. It energi I mean, it tenderizes your spirit. To the people that just can't stand waiting for more, they throw a little fasting in, and it accelerates the process of seeing. A lot of people, there is a fast in the Old Testament that is related to God and Him touching the land and His corporate purposes. There is a fast, very clear, related to the corporate purposes of God. But there's a bridegroom fast. John the, John the Baptist. Jesus talked about the bridegroom fast. The, those that see the bridegroom and they mourn for the bridegroom and then they fast. It's a lovesick fast. It's a different kind of fast than fasting for the purpose of God. I believe in both of them. If you can't stand waiting, you say, i got to have more. We'll throw a little fasting in. Dust the Bible off, a little prayer and fasting, turn off the TV a little bit, rearrange some of your, uh, your uh, uh, 
Time commitments at the job, you won't make as much money. You might have to downscale a little bit because the money won't be coming in. But you got time. And your, lar- your heart enlarges and increases and you begin to live life. He's beckoning the church into love sickness. And he does it by stunning uh, the church with the revelation of their beauty. But he focuses the very first thing on the eyes of revelation. The apostolic intercession, interestingly enough, the 25 apostolic prayers in the Bible, in the New Testament, most of them focus on the necessity to perceive and to see more clearly. Action and obedience flows out of perceiving. The number one issue in your life is to see differently. When you see differently, you will feel differently. And when you feel differently, you will obey very, very differently. Obedience takes on an entirely different feel when you see things different. The apostles' prayers focused on seeing it's the doorway into the fullness of God. Talks about her hair. The hair uh, speaks of consecration and dedication throughout the word. Symbolically, the hair is related to consecration and dedication. I talk about the Nazarite vow, spoke of the consecration and dedication, etc. I spend a page or two on how hair, he's calling forth her dedication. You can read this, put these things on your own. The third characteristic is her teeth. We have a, poor, a four-part description of her teeth from an agricultural perspective, which is the background of the Shulamite maiden. The Lord is speaking to her in language she's familiar with, which the larger principle is the Lord isn't going to probably speak to you in agricultural language in a way that's very effective. But the Lord knows how to speak the language of your heart to you. And the, sim, the, scripture, uh, uh, the scripture interprets the scripture. And you can find every one of these symbolisms and they're pretty clearly interpreted in the scripture. They're, there's not, they're not very, every now and then one's a little bit, well, you're not sure if it's this way or that way, but the vast majority of these descriptions are quite clear with even a general, a casual overview of the symbols that are right here in these five verses. The teeth speak of that which helps her to chew the meat. Paul the apostle used this very imagery, and he talked to the Corinthians, and the notes are here, about being babes, that it could only take milk, that could not chew the milk of the, I mean, the, the meat of the word. The apostle Paul uses the very same imagery right here from Song of Solomon. I'm not saying he's thinking of Song of Solomon, but it's teeth and milk and chewing and meat, and, the, and all associated to the word of God. He's talking about her life in the word of God, and beloved, there is no way forward and a heart tenderized of the power of God divorced from a life of long and loving meditation on the word if you're too busy for the word you're too busy to grow in a tender heart in love that's an absolute fact I'm absolutely convinced of that I meet people that say the mandate's too strong I don't have time for the word I say well then be a worker but I would rather be a lover who will end up working far harder than a work say a worker will burn out A lover will outwork a worker any day because a a lover is motivated by love. A worker has to go down the checklist. A lover has it memorized and has it written on her heart. God tenderizes your spirit in love. You'll do far more effective work with far less disruptions in the midst of where you're working because a worker gets offended. A worker, if they don't get their rights, they get mad. If they get neglected, they get real edgy. A lover is lovesick. They go, if you're mad at me, that's okay. I'm going to keep on in the work because I'm working for someone that you can't see. The, the lover carries the reward in their heart. The lover carries the reward with them everywhere. The reward is the power to love. The lover will always outwork the worker. I look at people and they say, we got to do the work. I say, I believe we can do both. It's not either or. And if we do them in proper sequence, we will work far more effective and far longer. And we will cause way few, uh, many, many less disruptions in the purpose of God because we're not so prickly and we're not so moody and we're not so touchy and we're not so divisive when our heart is romanced in the Lord. And say when all the American missionaries left China, the revival broke out. Okay, uh, I slipped it in. God's not just looking for workers. He's looking for lovers who work through a paradigm of love. He talks about her lips and the strand of scarlet. We know the scarlet speaks of redemption. And we have that, oh, there's some beautiful things. Our, our voice is sweet to the Lord. Our worship, our devotion, our words are impacted by the scarlet thread of redemption. This is one of my favorite ones. Your mouth is lovely. 
This is the Lord speaking to her. She's still immature. She doesn't embrace the most difficult things till chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. And on. She has only said yes, and the Lord is beckoning her. He's calling her, in the words of Gideon, mighty man of valor. He's calling her dedicated. He's esteeming her life in the word, her ability to perceive, her lips of grace. He's calling her forth. Her weaknesses are apparent to everyone, but he sees that cry in her spirit to walk in the beauty of God in these eight dimensions of her life. These are things that will not only make the Lord glad, they will make her glad as she develops in these. Holiness makes us glad. I tell you, holiness has a bad has been, have been uh, dealt uh, a bad rap because there's too much cranky holiness around. We need happy holiness in the body of Christ, which is the only real holiness that there is. That other thing is kind of a repackaged, made-over religious spirit with holiness terminology. Holiness is glad. There's delight in holiness. Anyway, your mouth is lovely. The fifth characteristic describes her mouth. Her mouth throughout the song follows the way that it was first introduced when she asked to know the kisses of his mouth. The mouth speaks of intimacy throughout the song. The mouth is associated with intimacy with the Lord. Because at the very beginning of the song, it is identified as the kisses of the mouth. The lips speak of our speech, and the mouth speaks of intimacy. She, the, uh, the Holy Spirit, or the Lord, obviously the Holy Spirit is the one that the Lord is using, is not being redundant. He's not repeating one of the characteristics twice. The lips of the mouth are not the same. He's looking at her saying, Intimacy with you is lovely to me. He goes, I love it when we have communion with one another. That's what's going on here. And you can study the mouth throughout the song. It speaks of the temples, which the Hebrew word is, is the word cheeks or, or the emotions. And we're going to skip that and read that on your own. Your neck is like the Tower of David. Each one of these, you know, at first when you read them, when I first read them, it's like, The first thing that strikes you is not, well, this is just an agricultural paradigm. You read it, you think, these are just strange. I mean, it really does. It strikes you as as something that you don't want someone who loves you to say to you. But I want to challenge you to, to go ahead and enjoy the humor of that for a moment. These terminologies are stunning. Every phrase is God's poetic, divine romance aiming at the heart in a way that even a specific, a, uh, the poetic language of God reaches places in our spirit that the line upon line left brain language can't touch. And this poetic language of God's heart, as I've studied these over and over, I look at these and I go, Lord, there's like four levels on every one of these. This isn't just like, this means that. It's like it means a number of them. And you kind of look up and he goes, yes, you're feeling a little bit of my romance. Yes, yes. And they mean many more than you can understand. So though you don't have to make chapter 4, verse 1 to 5 your top part of the book right now, but I assure you, if you take Song of Solomon serious, you will go back and drink from that part of the book before it's over, and it will stun your heart. And these things become powerful when you have a little understanding and they become a part of your prayer language with God when nobody's around you. He talks about her neck and the neck throughout the Bible and, we, and we, uh, I, I back it up in other passages, talks about the will. And I give a number of verses why the neck speaks of rebellion or the neck speaks of submissiveness. It speaks of the will. He says your neck is like, the, in essence, Your neck is like the heart of David. Your will is resolute. It's an armory. There's a stored up. There's a reservoir. There's a deep thought through. Count the cost. Resolution. There's a history in God. You're like an armory that has stored up all these weapons. Your will is effective against Satan's kingdom. And we talk about the place of the will in the next page or two. The will is a very important part. I really want to challenge you to read that on your own. Finally, now the Lord says, your eyes, your teeth, your hair, your dedication, your vision, your speech, your intimacy, one after the other, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. All of created order is stunned as the Lord is shouting, behold, your beauty moves me. And now she responds in verse 6. She's absolutely drunk with love. 
She goes, you really see these things in me? He goes, oh, I love you. And it's, it's real. Not only can he see throughout the end, he can see the end. He has the power to complete that which he began in you. Oh, I tell you, when he speaks these things over your hearts, beloved, you, some of you are in this room, you're going to hear this, say, oh, that's a neat little Bible verse. I'm going to actually do some of the word studies and think about my friends. No, these are about you right now in your weakness, in your brokenness, in your struggle. These things will awaken your heart. Don't relegate these for somebody else or some nice Bible study. These things are for you tonight. Look what she says. Look at the impact. Verse 6. Till the day breaks and the shadows flee away. In other words, until all the compromise is gone. And I explain why that means compromise. Till every gray area is gone. I will go my way to the mountain. Here she says it right here. She goes, remember chapter 2 verse 10. Come to the mountains. She goes, no. Chapter 3, verse 2, she goes to the city. He said, I want you in the high places. He stuns her. He ravishes her. She goes, I will go all the way. I'm not afraid of you. I want to be yours and only yours. I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh. Oh, it's fantastic. The bridal paradigm of the kingdom, the romance of the gospel will create a safety a sense of dignity and destiny, a sense of abandonment in your spirit, in my spirit, these things will do something in us that will give us the courage to ascend the mountain that God has before us, that he's challenging us to. The mountain is the high place of the glory of God, and the mountain is the obstacles that create fear in our life. It's facing both of them, which are two sides of one coin. I'll go to the mountain. There it is. It's the great verse, chapter 4, verse 16. One of the great turning verses of the entire song. I will go the whole way. Now listen to what she says, and I have this a lot more in the notes because I'm nearly out of time. She calls it the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. It's very, very significant. Myrrh throughout the book, myrrh is the burial spice. It's that sweet, costly, fragrant burial spice. And we'd established that in the earlier sessions. He says, it's going to cost you in the flesh. It is a mountain of myrrh. I want you to know that. It's not a mountain of Western affirmation. You're not going to be necessarily rich and famous before all men in this age. It is the mountain of myrrh. It will cost you in the flesh in this life, but I want you to go. It is a mountain of myrrh. It's the sweet, costly, fragrant burial spice for which Jesus Christ ascended the mountain of myrrh in his own life when he went to the cross. I want you to take up the cross. There's two parts of the cross I have written here in the notes. Where? Somewhere. Two parts to the message of the cross. The first part is what he did for us. The second part is when we deny ourselves, we deny our flesh to ascend, take up the cross. That's what he's calling her to. And she says, this is a life when she says, I will ascend, I will go to the mount, my way to the mountain of mercy, she is saying, there is absolutely nothing. I'm not saying I'm mature. I'm saying there's not one issue I'm saying no to. My time, my money, my speech, my sex life, every single area of my life is yours. Not that she's mature, but every area has not one issue that she says no to the Holy Spirit in. That is freedom when in our spirit we say, after the revelation of the beauty of God, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh. It's only myrrh to the flesh. It's only a burial spice to the flesh, and it's fragrant myrrh to our spirit. And in eternity, we see the wisdom of it. But she also goes to the hill of frankincense. And I have here in the notes, frankincense is the same as incense. Incense throughout the Bible in the book of Revelation in a number of places speaks of prayer. And he's calling her, he's saying this to her. If you're going to ascend the mountain, which is real big, you're going to have to have some prayer to help you on the journey. It's what he told Peter, and this is in the notes in, in uh, somewhere. I have them in the notes. Peter, he tells Peter, he tells Peter, you're going to deny me. And then in the garden, in Matthew 26, verse 40 and 41, he says, Peter, you better pray right now. That's the hill of frankincense. Because a mountain of myrrh is right around the corner. And the thing that I, I love about this is the proportion. The hill of frankincense is much smaller than the mountain of myrrh. One's a mountain, the other's a hill. Here's my point. Even a little bit of prayer goes a long way in the Lord. A little bit of prayer goes a long way in the Lord. 
We ascend into the glory of God, into revelation far beyond what we really deserve from our prayer life. And we're strengthened before the obstacles far more with a little bit of prayer. My point is, the Lord pays so well with just a little bit of effort is what he's saying right there. And I have a a, a bit more in the notes there. Very important. She says, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh. Beloved, you can't go on the path I'm going. I mean, in the sense it's the word of God, it's one path. But the strategy of God in my life and the strategy of God in your life is so totally different. That's why people ask me, what do you do in these areas of the disciplines in your life? And I don't want to tell them. I just frankly won't tell them. Because I don't want them to try to do what I'm doing because they have their own way to the mountain of myrrh that is, hand, that is tailor-made for who they are in this season of their life. That's a very important part. And he says, after she says, I will go all the way. I will go until the shadows are gone, until the gray areas are gone. He looks at her and he says, you are, for the first time, he adds the word all. You are altogether beautiful to me. And she says, but Jesus, I've only said yes. I haven't even gone yet. She goes, I know, but it's real. It's real in you. There is nothing between you and me. And I will, I will help you walk it out in the days to come. He says, I see no spot in you. He's not saying that she's sinless right now. He's saying that there's no area in her spirit. She's saying no to him. Now she has just to walk it out. But when the yes is there, about 70% of the victory is already accomplished. Amen. Let's stand. You know, I I forgot verse 8. It's a mountain of lepers and lions. I'm just going to mention that. It's It's the call to spiritual warfare. I just overlooked it. The mountains are where it's warfare. He's calling us into a worshiping warrior, a bridal partnership. Worshiping warriors, lovers and workers. Because on the mountaintops that we go with him, there are lions and lepers. There's devouring animals. It's hazardous in the flesh, but it's exhilarating in the spirit. And we have that in the notes. I just totally overlooked that page. I looked at Oops. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would take these meditations. You would draw forth out of their spirit, Lord, these realities. Lord, I ask that these truths would enter into their prayer dialogue with you in secret. These would become part of their love talk to you and you back to them. That would empower their heart with the stunning the stunning reality of of our beauty before you. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.